It all begins in Belgium in the 1930s, in the Royal Museums of Art and History at the saint contenaire Park in Brussels, where a certain Henri Lavacherie is working. Easter Island and its mysterious statues fascinate him. His grandson, Thomas, delved into his grandfather's archive to reconstruct the story of what became the most famous study of Easter Island from the first half of the 20th century, known as the Franco-Belgian Expedition. A French scholar, Guillaume de Evesy, had established a connection between writing found on Easter Island, I say writing, but that's really an overstatement, when in 1930 excavations were made in the Indus at Mohenjo-Daro, and on small alabaster seals they found writing quite similar to that found on wooden tablets on Easter Island. Hence the idea that there might be a link between the ancient civilization of the Indus and Easter Island. And my grandfather and Paul Rivet, who was then curator at the Trocadero Museum in Paris, both decided that they had to go to Easter Island to check how close they were and hoped to find under the soil of Easter Island traces of a large ancient city similar to the one discovered in the Indus. The expedition set off in 1934, but during a stopover in Patagonia, the French archaeologist caught a disease and died. The Swiss, Alfred Metro, and Belgian, Henri Lavacherie, were the only ones to land on Easter Island. That, incidentally, is why my grandfather took on the archaeology alone. Metro looked after the ethnography. The two men had different ideas. While Lavacherie dreamed of a lost civilization, Metro was convinced that the giant statues were actually carved by the ancestors of the people currently living there. So there was disagreement. They could have fought about it, but they didn't, because they actually got on very well, and largely because Metro was able to convince my grandfather of the merits of his theory. France and Belgium had received permission from Chile, which governs Easter Island, to take away two statues. France made do with a head, but Henri Lavacherie decided to bring an entire statue aboard the Mercata, which had sailed in to bring the expedition home. Lavacherie decided on a statue of more than two meters high, weighing about six tons. And on May the 14th, 1935, the statue arrived in Brussels. But 65 years later, we still don't know anything about this statue. How old is it? What is its history? Questions that Nicola Coe, a specialist in prehistory and Oceania, can't help but ask. Only archaeology can reveal some clues to its mysteries. Nicola Coe thinks a simple examination of the statue is not enough and that he must return to the place it was taken from. In 2000, we had a problem understanding the statue preserved in Brussels, which was brought here in 1935 on the Mercata. We knew the exact place it had come from on Easter Island, but nothing else. But this statue is quite unusual. It has a rather peculiar shape, and it doesn't look like most of the statues on Easter Island. And we really did want to find out what we could about it. Seventy-five years after the Franco-Belgian expedition, the archaeologists are back in Rapa Nui, the Polynesian name for Easter Island. There's only one town, Hangaroa, actually just a large village of 4,000 inhabitants, of which about half come from Easter Island. For these people, discovered in 1722 by a Dutch sailor, the arrival of Europeans was a real curse especially in the second half of the 19th century. After suffering deportation, slavery and disease, by 1877, there were only 111 natives left, mainly children. So the island's oral history was lost. In the early 20th century, the island was transformed into a giant sheep farm, and Easter Islanders were kept behind barbed wire in the village of Hangaroa. 
It was not until 1963 that residents were finally able to reclaim their destiny. Today, things have certainly changed. More than 50,000 visitors arrive every year to see the famous Moai, the legendary statues, reproduced in every form imaginable for tourists who are the island's main source of income. Tour guides speak of a catastrophe in the early 17th century, following the felling of all the trees on the island to move the statues. It would be followed by a famine, leading to war between clans and the violent destruction of the monuments. The few statues still left standing on great altar-like monuments, known as Ahu in Polynesian, have actually been recently restored because by the mid-19th century, not one statue remained standing on its Ahu. It's against this background that Belgian archaeologists start their initial search on a site close to Hangar Roa. The statue in Brussels was removed from here at Oronga. It came from a small monument that we found during the excavation in 2001, now hidden because we covered it over again. But we've been able to show that the little pile of rocks behind me here is a monument which had been almost completely overshadowed by the subsequent construction of a very big monument, which is above here. And the statue which emerged from the ruins was taken away in 1935, put on a raft and transported to the Mercator, which was anchored just offshore, about where that ship is today. Henri Lavacherie couldn't have known the history of this statue, but when we were digging there, we realized that it belonged not to the monument visible on the surface, as he thought, but to an earlier monument that was partially buried under the monument that's still visible above ground today. Archaeology is all about surprises. You look for something and find something else. In reality, this statue comes with a monument that was completely covered by sediment, something that was hitherto unknown on Easter Island. We only knew about the monuments on the surface and thought that everything was on the surface. We had the impression that if you dig a bit, you very soon come to the lava, the bedrock, and so there was no hope of finding stratigraphic monuments. So we were lucky in 2000-2001 to chance upon a monument completely buried in the sediment, which is obviously an archaeologist's dream, since there's a sedimentary context allowing us to do all the dating, reconstruction of the environment and so on. This monument is now one of the oldest stratigraphic finds on Easter Island. And we've been able to date it because we found charcoal in the sediment. It's from the late 13th or 14th century. Given its size, its dimensions, it's two meters tall after all, it's not really certain to be the oldest statue, but it is the only one whose age we've been able to determine so far. The dig sheds new light on the history of Easter Island. Could there have been several phases in the history of Easter Island, of which only the most recent is still visible on the surface? Already in 1993, during excavations in preparation for the reconstruction of a huge monument located on the southeast coast of the island, the Chilean archaeologist Claudio Cristino had observed the presence of older monuments under the main Ahu, but could not take it any further. Ahu Tongariki Ahu Tongariki was the largest monument ever built on Easter Island, and I think it is one of the most important religious monuments in Polynesia. From a strictly archaeological viewpoint, the result shows us that this was a monument that has evolved over four or five centuries, which began with small monuments set next to each other, and finally, this huge old structure was constructed on the two ancient Aus. We have the dates of the first occupation, the first construction, around the 14th century, and we have no precise date for the last monument, but there's no doubt that it is from the 16th or 17th century. On Easter Island, Ahus are generally consistent with the location of the various villages scattered along the coast. But were practices the same from one village to another? 
from one side of the island to the other. Until now, there was no way of knowing. After several exploratory sorties, Nicola Co chooses the Poike Peninsula as his area of investigation. This protected area, inaccessible to tourists, is the farthest from the town of Hangaroa, site of the first excavation. Today's town is a modern creation. We know that the people lived all around the island. So we walked everywhere looking for ancient monuments, places likely to have a good stratigraphy where there was a chance of finding ancient monuments below ground. So here on the coast, at the bottom of a really good slope, there's a strong chance of finding good sedimentation, which was the first thing of interest to us. It's not the beauty of the monument, whether it's near or far from the city, it's the archaeological and sedimentary potential. The monument is in ruins because it's up against a cliff, and there is a quite natural collapse of the rear facade. But at the same time, the front was well preserved and used as a buffer to an entire flow of sediment that covered over a whole part of Easter Island's story. That story is one of the successive construction of three monuments, definite sequences interspersed with periods of abandonment and reconstruction, as if different generations of villagers successively used, then abandoned this place. But the most surprising thing is that even the oldest monuments seem to have been partially dismantled, perhaps to carry off the most precious elements somewhere else. For the oldest two monuments, and even for the most recent one here, we found the terraces that were buried under the monuments. These terraces still had some large boulders on them, but some of the boulders were missing. We found where they had been. No statues associated with the monument either. So there was a regular removal, but it was never complete, just some items, and they were systematically and intentionally dumping red shale between each monument. And all that had nothing to do with a particular time of crisis. It was spread over three centuries. And what's more, it shows no sign of corresponding to acts of violence. In the end, these monuments were extremely temporary. They could withstand two or three, maximum four generations not even a century. And then the monuments were removed. They'd no doubt set them up somewhere else, having carried away the essential things, and three or four generations later, they returned to the place that had been previously abandoned and rebuilt them as new monuments. So it's quite an astonishing discovery. These monuments were absolutely not built to last forever and to defy time. They were simply created to last as long as a particular village did, according to the fertility or depletion of the soil. Not only was the discovery of these sequences something new, it also raised a lot of questions. Okay, so the monuments are temporary structures, the ones that you see everywhere on the island. Are they really ruins? Have they not simply been dismantled, like the ones we looked at, and so on? Year after year, Nicolaco's team continues its research. It now has evidence that the monuments and statues were regularly dismantled and moved. But what about the Aarhus, whose statues appear to have been violently pushed over? In an attempt to understand the fate of these giants, the archaeological team begins a new search. We've just started to investigate the Ahuteniu monument. Niu means coconut tree. It lies on the west coast, north of Hangaroa. So we began an exploration of the monument because it offered a double advantage. It was in a place where we could expect good sedimentation for the early phases, since it's at the bottom of a slope that was used as a market garden, so we'd probably have good sedimentation that's engulfed the ruins. And then too, what was visible on the surface were several statues in quite different situations. Among the multidisciplinary team, Morgan de Dapper of the University of Ghent is responsible for a particularly important mission. I'm working here on an archaeological project, but I'm not an archaeologist. I'm a geographer-physicist by training. 
a geomorphologist, someone who studies the Earth's relief. For some time, I have specialized in geoarchaeology, which is the application of geomorphology to archaeological research. Geomorphology is a very interesting science because it will not only explain the conditions of the burial, but all the processes, all the dynamics that created the landfill. That might be natural runoffs, digging of valleys, quarrying rock, and so on. And all the anthropogenic processes, too. Today, archaeology working without the earth sciences is unthinkable to really understand in detail all the conditions of buried remains. The first job of the geomorphologist will be to understand all the site's natural history. So that's why he'll need to descend to the bedrock, where we see the beginning of the decomposition of rocks, to try to understand a natural sequence and investigate it. First, find out its size, and so estimate its chronological time period, and so on, and find within that sequence abnormalities that are due to human occupation. It can be a huge task. You have to dig several meters down. But you obviously have to know all about the natural environment in order to identify what impact or influence the human population has had on it. Geomorphology also gives an idea of the ancient history of the island, of which some 170 square kilometers are entirely of volcanic origin. On the surface, there are no rivers because the rock is too porous, but some craters are huge reservoirs of fresh water. The oldest parts, like the Poike Peninsula, appeared a million years ago, while the latest lava flows date back just 2,000 years. In this cooled lava, traces of lush vegetation can be found, such as impressions of palm tree trunks that demonstrate the abundance of forest cover. So what happened? Did the Easter Islanders cut down all the trees to transport the statues? French researchers Catherine and Michel Orliac have recently studied the evolution of the island's flora and climate. We can reconstruct the flora present since the arrival of men using the charcoal and charred plants contained in the Easter Islanders' kitchen ovens. At the same time, it gives us a time frame because we date the charcoal we identify. So we are sure of the match between the reconstituted flora and the chronological time frame of this reconstruction. For Michel Orliac, destruction of the forest caused solely by human action seems unlikely, contrary to what we are usually told. There is a paradox in attributing the disappearance of the forest to these people. It would be quite surprising on the part of sailors, and even more surprising on the part of the most extraordinary sailors the world has ever seen, because it was they who transported their society further than any others. A boat, a Polynesian boat, is something you maintain. And this presupposes managing and maintaining a stock of wood and trees large enough to make planking for big boats. In the plant remains found in kitchen ovens, Catherine and Michel Orliac have identified 23 tree, shrub and bush species. But in the mid-17th century, all traces of this flora disappear to make way for grass and some crops for food and sale. How to explain the disappearance, which is real, of all the lignus flora between 1650 and 1722, when it happened. It is a brutal phenomenon, and we must find a global reason, an overriding reason. The only reason that plants generally disappear is because of drought. Research on coral reefs in New Caledonia showed that there were two periods of great drought 
each lasting more than a decade in the second half of the 17th century because of El Niño. Now it seems that the climatic impact of El Niño is the same in New Caledonia and Easter Island. Donc, et là, une hypothèse, so, and this is just a theory, it is not impossible that the severe drought observed in the mid-17th century in New Caledonia, which is a fact, not a theory, also happened on Easter Island, causing the disappearance of woody vegetation, that is, trees and shrubs. La disparition des végétaux ligneux, c'est-à-dire des arbres et des arbustes. To the southeast of the island, the Rano Raraku volcano dominates the landscape. It's from this magical place, now frequented by wild horses, that most of the giant statues that dot the island came. For the Polynesians, this huge crater and the stones they took from it had mystical powers. The power of the representations of ancestors was linked not only to their petrified image, but also the material of which they were made. Paradoxically, this soft, easily carvable rock is particularly brittle and may break up at the slightest touch. One of the great enigmas of Easter Island has always been the question of transporting the Moai. How could people living in the Stone Age have carried these gigantic statues intact from one end of the island to another? The inner and outer walls of the volcano still contain many Moai. The only ones found still standing at the end of the 19th century and the largest ever carved. Many observers believe these statues were ready to leave for their destinations along the coast when the volcano quarry was suddenly abandoned. So there's always been this idea of Moai that are finished, ready to go to the monuments. The problem is that most of those that are really finished are unbelievably large. But again, it's the starting point that's wrong. We base ourselves on the only ones that we're sure have never been transported to try to imagine how others were transported. In absolute terms, I've no idea how the statues were carried, those that are really scattered around the edges of the island. But in any case, they really have been transported, and it's quite possible that they were not absolutely finished when they were moved. We might imagine that blocks of stone were transported rather than the finished statues, of course. So it's likely that the finishing was done on the Ahu itself. I can only speak for two or three monuments which we excavated, but it's quite possible that the details of hands, noses and other features were completed on site. And that's quite logical when you see the fine details on some statues. After a rather complicated journey, some 20 miles for some, it seems hardly credible that they were moved, finished. On the sites he's excavated, Nicolas Co has found large outcrops of yellow tuff used to make the statues. Nevertheless, the fact remains that being able to transport such huge stones seems extraordinary. It's certain that blocks as large as the statues here, just as heavy, and sometimes even bigger, have been transported elsewhere in the world. The example I know best is the European megalithic period, from the 5th millennium BC until around the beginning of the 3rd millennium BC, so it's a relatively long time. In Europe, we've been able to make a series of reconstructions and experiments, and we realized that the transport of blocks, obviously not statues with all the detail, noses, ears, and so on, even blocks weighing several tons posed absolutely no problem, provided you have the time. After all, if you subscribe to this principle, transporting a statue here on Easter Island over the longest distance, just over 20 kilometers, you can imagine it taking a month, two months, three months at most to transport it. Let's face it, there's nothing too unbelievable about that.
According to legends recorded in the early 20th century, the disappearance of the forest would have led to a terrible famine, causing a brutal war for survival. This would be the famine that was behind the decline of Easter Island culture and the destruction of the Moai. Recently, some scientists have referred to the emaciated-looking wooden statues of Easter Island to reinforce this hypothesis. So here we have one of the most famous themes in the Easter Island sculpture, these so-called Kava Kava Moai. They're always men, and Kava Kava means rib cage, so literally it means rib man. However, it is real flesh, legs, penis, belly, arms, face. And this statue, which is quite exceptional, was dated some years ago. They took a small sample of wood and they estimate it was carved in the 15th century, well before the maximum degradation of the environment, well before any possibility of famine, if ever there was a famine. That's another thing yet to be proven. The deforestation of the island doesn't automatically infer a lack of food, since the Polynesians are farmers and deforestation doesn't stop crops growing. The Polynesians grew mainly vegetables and fruit. To compensate for the lack of forest cover, Easter Islanders made shrewd use of the geological features, such as collapsed lava tubes, natural trenches in which they planted their vegetables and fruit trees, allowing the roots to stay in the shade and moisture, while having plenty of light for the foliage. They also kept chickens, which they brought with them in their huge canoes. They developed dozens of acres of fields with porous volcanic stone for protection. Here and there, artificial protection systems, known as the Manavi, house very small areas where plants are grown. Despite the absence of forest, the islanders had an abundant and perfectly balanced diet. As the first European sailors who came to the island for supplies bore witness. Roggeveen in 1722 admires the fields. He's given a lot of food when he leaves. He refuses some because there's too much and ends up taking a few chickens and some bananas. But throughout the 18th century, people describe farming that's not big in terms of area, but well organized. Finally, the anthropological study that confirms the historical evidence. The analysis of samples of bones found on Easter Island would reveal any stress caused by malnutrition. Since 2004, more than 150 individuals have been studied by anthropologist Caroline Pollet. From the samples I studied, which date mainly from the 17th to the 19th centuries, I can conclude that there has apparently been no really serious bout of starvation on Easter Island. There are no frequent major stress markers. In fact, the frequencies are comparable to those found in other Pacific islands. And so there was apparently no more stress between the 17th and the 19th centuries on Easter Island than elsewhere in the Pacific. So if there was no famine, what about the war and the violent destruction of monuments? Regarding the intertribal wars that supposedly destroyed all the Easter Island monuments, there are two problems. The islanders were brutally uprooted from their past and their memory is a reconstruction. It's their own interpretation of the remains. The second is that the monuments really look ruined and destroyed. But when you look closely, they're actually organized. It's systematic, organized dismantling. So the question is not about whether they fought or not. It's why they dismantled their monuments. <laughs> 
ils ont démonté, les Pasquois ont démonté un jour leur monument. In some Ahu, the statues appear to have been purposely concealed under huge piles of stones. On a le mur du monument. This is the monument wall, and here the boulders of the old terrace on which the monument was placed, going up to here. We have the corner there at the end, and then we have a huge ramp built later that dominates it all, in which we'll see that a number of statues were concealed. The statues were clearly buried on purpose because it's a colossal job to gather these stones. And it's fairly well built, so it really seals up this monument. This is not a unique phenomenon in the world. There are other societies. The megaliths in Europe between the 5th and 3rd millennium BC also had so-called dolmens, which are actually tombs, and they also decided at one point to shut them away. They were either covered with slabs, piles of stones, or huge mounds of earth that took forever to build, of course. It's maybe not the same thing here, but it's comparable as a process. There's a monument that served the community, and at a certain point it was dispensed with using all sorts of processes that are relatively slow to implement. Our problem now is to continue the excavations to try to show specifically how the statues were permanently buried. On the site of Ahu Te Niu, archaeologists begin to understand the history of this monument. A recumbent statue has been found buried under a pile of stones. Voilà. Alors, Serge, euh, oui, la, la poche de Aniani est en fait au-dessus du bétadé. Oui, ça je vais t'entendre une petite une petite épaisseur là où c'est épais pour la couche de construction oui. sur lequel vient le Aniani. Donc on peut faire d'abord. Euh, ça monte deux trois points sur la couche de construction. Juste là, c'est parce qu'après, elle est vraiment déposée sur le, le bêta 2. Donc à 2 mètres 60. Ce site a connu une histoire. This site has a fairly long history. There was an initial occupation marked by the scorched earth here. We found traces of post holes, whose significance we don't yet know, but a first monument was built here. This monument was then used as the foundation for a later one, which was dressed with beautiful old slabs. We begin to get a better view of the base of the statue that rests on stones prepared in advance. It's certain that this stone was set first, then the statue, because there's a wedge between the two. Because before cutting down the statue, they didn't know exactly how high it would be. So there's a small wedge. We can also see that the slab doesn't quite hold the statue straight, it's slightly tilted. But we see that all these stones were there before the statue. Under the statue, archaeologists have uncovered a burial vault. Here there's a cover slab on which the statue is standing, so clearly the vault was built in advance. So, this is a special case where apparently the tomb was built first and then the statue placed on top. Gradually, Nicolas Coe's team begins to understand the different phases of this monument. A large slab blocks access to the vault. Can it be taken out without it collapsing? I'm not sure it's a good idea to remove it. 
Oh, he's already removed it. The way is clear. Archaeologists can continue working underneath the statue. The tomb contains the bones of several individuals, at least six, including a child. But as often happens, the skeletons are not intact. This type of burial has existed only since the 17th century, which marks a significant change in burial practices. Previously, the bodies were burnt and the ashes scattered before the Ahu under the eyes of the Moai. So it is certainly one of the most beautiful vaults on Easter Island, since the walls are perfectly vertical with regularly shaped tiles. The ceiling is made of slabs, also perfectly shaped. They're clearly recovered from the old platform and placed in the vault. And then the stairs that provide access to the vault. It's quite amazing. And the intention is very clear here. The vault was built to have the statue as a cover. And then there is again a phase of abandonment that we can see here just above the head of the statue. Natural sedimentation, formation of the surface, and then later a return to the site to deposit all these stones. And the whole site will be covered up with stones to seal it up permanently. It's clear that if they'd wanted to simply get rid of the monument and statues, there would have been no need to use such complex methods. And they didn't want to destroy the monuments, just to change their role. In the story of the hypothetical collapse of civilization on Easter Island, where the monuments were torn down, there's also the whole issue of the Ranuraraku volcano quarry, where we find dozens of statues still there, planted in the ground, but also a large number of half-finished ones. Again, it's a kind of illusion. All these statues, whether finished or not, are not the same as those that were transported across the island in previous centuries. The biggest difference is the eyes. The statues that were transported and erected on the altars have cavities to allow eyes to be inlaid. Inlays, we found two or three of them made of coral and the pupil made of red shale. The statues in the quarry have a great slash across their face but one which can't be inlaid, as if they were meant to be blind. The other difference is that even though they're very large, larger than the others, they're much thinner, especially the back of the nose is very flat. And it makes the top of the head quite narrow and impossible to place the large round headdresses seen on other statues made of red shale. In Polynesian, they're called Pukaho, which means a bun of hair. These statues are blind and they can't have the usual headdress. Then they're very large, much larger than the ones carried across the island. Some are 10 to 15 meters high. And they made them so big because they knew they would not be moving them around the island. Why wouldn't they move them? Because there was no wood? Well, that's one hypothesis. Or was it simply that they made large statues because they wanted to leave them there? However, in places, it appears that the sculptors had abandoned their work. Yes, there is a whole series of statues deemed to be unfinished, but if you look closely, some actually could be completed. They do seem to be unfinished, but there's also a whole series, quite a few of them, where you can easily see that they couldn't finish the job. 
We have an attempt, part of a statue already completed, but it's in a vein in which it couldn't be continued because another has already been carved perpendicularly, or because a few centimeters beyond the chin there's a crack in the rock. So there are all kinds of problems. If we imagine that all the statues started here in Ranu Raroku were intended to be completed, it's not credible, it's just not consistent. We're dealing with people who have carved hundreds of statues. They have experience. They've transported hundreds across the island. They know what they're doing. And so it would be surprising that one day they begin to carve statues knowing it's not possible to finish them or extract them. This would fly in the face of the centuries of experience they had. So all this makes me think they really wanted to humanize a part of these cliffs. What mattered was to make the shapes of statues, or even sometimes to complete them, but in places where there was no question of extracting them. Was Rano Raraku then a kind of sanctuary, bringing all the ancestors together? To understand the significance of this volcano, the first thing is to understand the chronology. When does it all date from? Was it before, after or during the use of the Ahu? There's very little evidence allowing us to determine anything from a chronological point of view, except that most are unfinished statues in veins where we see that there have been extractions of rock. So we feel they were done at the end of the time the volcano quarry was used. So it seems they're later than the transported statues. What's more, all the finished statues are planted just outside the volcano, preventing new statues being brought down. They're a barrier. If you try to get a statue down the cliff, you'll bump into all the statues that are planted in the ground below. So it seems they were in a terminal phase. And there's a last little clue. There's a statue down here which is engraved with a boat, clearly a three-masted western vessel. And this boat was only revealed after the removal of sediment that covered it. It means that this is something fairly recent because a buried statue already bore the image of a boat the islanders could only have discovered in the 18th century. All around the perimeter of the island, you can see statues lying far from any monument, as if they'd been abandoned suddenly during transport. As for the volcano quarry, the legend has it that tribal war suddenly interrupted the movement of these statues to their destination. There are nearly a hundred, but they had never been examined. With the help of Claudio Cristino and his team, Nicolas Co began the study of one of these abandoned statues. And they were in for a surprise. They discover a pit used to erect the statue dug into the basalt rock. So it was already at its intended destination. It was embedded in the pit and has subsequently been deliberately laid down, like the Moai on the Ahu. It appears that all the statues outside Rano Raraku have been carefully laid down in front of their plinths. Could we then speak of a change in tradition or a new religious cult? The hypothesis is particularly interesting because at the end of the Easter Island story, from the 17th century on, the cult of Makemake appears. They didn't invent the god at that time, but they did start to worship him then. The first missionaries in the 19th century speak of it, so we have direct evidence. And this god is mainly represented by the eyes, it's his gaze that matters. And you get the impression that the gaze moves from one entity to another. The ancestors have sight, they make the world go round. So they confiscated the eyes and made them blind, no longer giving the statues cavities for inlaid eyes, so only the god Makemake has sight. The god Makemake, abundantly represented on Easter Island, is one of the most commonly found pictures today in rock art, often represented only by his eyes or by the Birdman, a character who was designated annually by a dangerous and quite violent contest. The people of Easter Island used to meet on the top of the Ranukau volcano, whose crater had become a great lake. Under the edge of the volcano, between the lake and the sea, a small village was built, the village of Orongo, with dry stone houses where they would assemble. 
each tribe would send a contestant who had to climb down the cliff to the sea and cross a narrow channel to an island called Motunui. And the contestants would wait here for the migratory birds to arrive. The one who found the first egg of the year and brought it back to Orongo, back across the inlet and up the cliff, was the winner. This island is very important because it has 21 caves, some of which are decorated, so we have lots of carvings and rock paintings here, and of course there is a rich variety of bird species that nest on the island. The man who managed to bring back the first egg was named Birdman for a year. His power was very extensive because he could cast or remove spells. This power, conferred again with each new competition, was received from the god Make Make, whom he represented. The main symbol found in these caves, both in paintings, relief, and also burned on the rocks, is the mask of Make Make, whose most important feature is his staring eyes. You find a lot of these in Orongo, at the top of the cliff and also on the slabs, the volcanic slabs on which lots of masks are etched, especially in Tongariki. The islanders have experienced a slow transformation of their religious beliefs and practices, perhaps since the disappearance of the forest. Did the giants of Easter Island already belong to a cult of the past? The first problem is to understand what these big statues represented. We know that Polynesian societies are essentially based on ancestor worship. Gods created the world, they created men and the world order, but global governance is entrusted to the ancestors, and consequently Polynesian societies need their ancestors in order to function. This results in highly fragmented societies, since the ancestors work on behalf of their own lineage, their descendants, of course, and this results in family clans who work for themselves. At that time, large statues were transported across the island, mounted on the altars and shrines that largely correspond to the location of villages. So there's very, very little doubt that these statues are really not the ancestors themselves, but a sort of representation of the ancestors into which they could bring the ancestors' spirit when they needed to talk with them. The statues of the volcano quarry, which are of a somewhat different type, are likely to represent the same thing, except they were probably made at a time when people didn't want to talk with the ancestors very much. And so they no longer carried them to the place where the ancestors lived, they're all collected in this volcano quarry. A bit like the Christians did with the saints. The saints are super dead, who don't belong to their descendants, they belong to everyone. And perhaps the ancestors imprisoned in the volcano quarry may be this kind of super dead who can't act, or at least no longer belong to a particular lineage. They're more generalized, and therefore can globalize the politico religious and social life on Easter Island. When you visit Easter Island, you see all these statues nicely arranged parallel to each other in front of their stone plinths, but they're no longer standing on their monument. They're lying face down in the earth. But on several monuments, not only have they been toppled, but an enormous pile of stones has buried them. So these statues were not pushed over because of rivalries or disagreement and chaos on the island, but were toppled and buried in some cases for ideological reasons. The ancestors were probably no longer very popular. They'd become something of a burden. The world order had to change, so the ancestors were disposed of. So it seems that at one point, the ancestors were simply replaced by the gods.